Let's, uh, let's welcome uh, Professor Tyson for his last lecture. So, um, well, um, and uh, so uh, he will uh, firstly, I think, continue uh, talking about uh, India's case, and then uh, is uh, uh, yeah, okay. So uh, maybe, maybe I shouldn't say anything about uh, anything else. So it must not time to take. So please uh, go ahead. Well, thank you very much, and thank you for surviving uh, the, the uh, entire lecture series. Congratulations! I mean, so, uh, so <laughs> but it's I appreciate. It. So uh, you can definitely see this lecture as continuation of uh, the last lecture, and uh, let me remind you the broader paradigm that I'm following, namely the minimalist market design. So the following is my joint research and policy strategy. So I'm not just solving a research problem. I'm also not just attacking uh, a policy problem. I'm shaping the research question so that my policy objective is viable. So when I communicate with policymakers, you know, I have a very solid goal. So, so that's the idea. So how, how do I do that? Well, first, I understand that, you know, if I just stick to neoclassical paradigm, uh, I might have trouble communicating with policymakers, right? That might be the winning paradigm among economists, but that's definitely not the case in a lot majority of you know real life applications. Uh, what I mean is just sticking to those principles uh, is kind of uh, not appreciated. Okay. So I need something, I need a paradigm which allows for neoclassical you know, principles. And in some cases, I might even just merely stick to those ideas if that's what stakeholders want. But otherwise, I'm really agnostic. So I'm not trying to convert everything to a game. Uh, in many cases, the interesting part of the problem will be about property rights, you know, designing property rights. Uh, in many cases, though, you know, there will be uh, private information aspects, but that will not be the only aspect. That's the point. So, what do I do? I identify the mission of the institution. What are the primary objectives of the policymaker, system operators, and other stakeholders? That in itself is a lot of work. Right. Uh, my best friend is the history of the institution, if I can uh, find it. Right. Sometimes, if you just follow this history, you'll know what they're trying to do. And you'll be able to formulate it immediately. Uh, but it, it was probably a challenge for them. Then, I check whether the institution in place satisfies these primary objectives or not. If it doesn't, then I have an opportunity, even though I'm an outsider, you know, like I'm typically not welcome because I'm coming with a criticism of a lot of hard work, right? Then I can say that, look, it seems like this is what you're trying to do. Here's the evidence whatever that evidence is. It seems like this is causing some issues. Here's the evidence. I can fix those problems. Now, to optimize my chance of success, I do that in such a way that I don't touch the part of the system that I don't need to touch. Right? So one strategy could be, you know what? There's an inconsistency with what they are trying to do and then what they are doing. 
then I can completely reform the problem. Maybe I uh, come up with an objective function. Like I can just convert the problem in the uh, you know into forms that I'm familiar with, like mechanism design format or whatever, right? And, and that might work, maybe, right? But it's also possible that I might you know upset something I'm not supposed to. Okay. So to minimize that chance, what I do is I identify the root causes of the failures within the existing system. So if one, well, it's one were to write a theoretical paper about this, essentially what I'm doing is you have a bunch of uh, objectives and maybe they are, uh, they can be present into a maximization problem, maybe something else. In my case, often it involves you know axioms, but it doesn't need to be restricted to that. So that's one set of primitives, if you wish. Another one is the existing system, and I kind of combine them. Right, I take the existing system, remove the parts that's compromising the mission, and then come up with a new system. Right. One can actually develop a tier of this, like in some special cases, like you cannot have a general tier or something like that, right? Uh, so in doing so, it is as if I'm doing a minimally invasive procedure, right? Hence, minimalist market design. Now, these are the main tasks. And these three main tasks uniquely identified which institution should be used both in the army's application, army's branching case, so the second part of lecture two, and also in the Indian affirmative action case. Okay. But this doesn't need to be always the case. Like this minimal invasive idea, minimalist idea, it's not a completely a formal idea. It really depends on the particular setting. And it might, it might mean different things. Okay. So and so we were lucky in Army's branching process and uh, uh, joint implementation of vertical and horizontal reservations. So indeed, the mission was attainable and it was attainable in a unique way. In some applications, private objectives of the stakeholders may not be attainable, right? For example, I mean, the well known case by now is the incompatibility between party efficiency and no justified envy in school jobs. You know, you cannot get both of them unless all school priorities are identical. Okay. Then a judgment needs to be made. You can, one can do many things. You know, you can pick one objective over the other one. You can try to create, you know, a hybrid, a compromise objective, so, and we have done all of this, right? The school choice, you know, we have bits and pieces of, uh, you know, these approaches. So that in itself is a big task, uh, defining these compromise policies. In some applications, which will be relevant today, and this was also very relevant uh, in the pandemic resource allocation, you know, research program that's, uh, uh, we have a forthcoming paper in management science uh, uh, about that. And there, the tone of the presentation is also related. But this application is a more striking case where the point that I will do today uh, is very clear why it matters. So suppose there is an inconsistency 
between the mission of the institution with the objectives and the existing system, but there are multiple minimalist ways to resolve this. What is our responsibility? Now, many economists will not bother actually thinking about that. Now, you know, there's a problem, I'm solving it, that's it. Like there was an issue, I resolved it. End of story, right? But if we do that, sometimes we might introduce systematic biases in the outcome, right? Uh, the mission of the institution might not be explicitly stating, you know, certain objectives, but nonetheless, they might not want, you know, certain groups to be, you know, uh, discriminated against or favored in a systematic way. And to me, this is even more dangerous if it happens in a secret way. Maybe intentionally, maybe unintentionally. But often unintentionally. Maybe by the design economist, maybe by the policymaker himself, uh, actually. Right? So one, so this idea is a little bit related to uh, Zoe Hitzek's uh, uh, normative gap idea. One can introduce gaps between, normative gaps between intended policies and implemented policies. Okay. Now, if the setting is an axiomatic setting, if you can represent objectives through axioms, an axiomatic characterization might be a way to uh, attack this, actually. So that's why you know, this approach, minimalist market design, uh, maybe it goes best with you know, axiomatic uh, methodology. I'm not suggesting that it is only useful in that setting, but I find that part, uh, particularly you know, convenient. So basically, the an additional fourth task that I will impose in minimalist market design is if there are multiple resolutions, minimalist uh, resolutions, try to give an as complete description as possible. You might not always be able to give full axiomatic characterization and uh, I'll not give full axiomatic characterization today, but you'll see what the interesting minimalist resolutions are. Actually. Okay. So this is also conceptually related to Shang Wu Li's informed neutrality idea between reasonable ethical principles. That's what he says. I call it reasonable normative principles. Okay. So basically, in terms of conceptual uh, contribution, the focus today is that fourth supplemental task. Uh, and I expect in most applications, uh, it will be relevant. Okay? But in some settings, it might be more important than the other one. If there are you know, socioeconomic discussions, uh, if society is really sensitive about the outcome, then this fourth step uh, might be very important. Okay, so a lot of this, I will go really fast because we discussed them in detail yesterday. Okay, so we have vertical reservations and horizontal reservations in India. Vertical reservations are intended as Reparatory and compensatory instrument uh, because of you know millennia of, of you know discrimination 
and marginalization of uh, certain uh, groups. Okay. And prior to 2019, they were exclusively awarded to members of socially and educationally backward classes. So this is the, this is the legal term, uh, which covers scheduled castes, scheduled tribes, and other backward classes. Okay. And because uh, of the caste system, no individual is a member of uh, more than one of these categories in India. So the mathematical uh, structure, you know, non-overlapping vertical protections we assumed yesterday was a direct implication of uh, the caste system. Uh, now, 2019, there's, there was a big change, uh, which came with a huge debate. There was a constitutional amendment. So indeed, this debate came with a constitutional amendment in India. Okay? And it, if you read about it, it seems like there's a lot of you know, politics involved. Uh, and uh, I guess part of the political idea was, you know, getting more votes from general category. Uh, okay. So in a highly controversial amendment in January 19, vertical reservations are awarded for members of a new category called economically weaker sections. EWs. Okay. Basically, now there is another vertical reservation up to 10% uh, to poor people. But criteria such that more than 95% of the general category individuals qualifies for you know, that criteria. So essentially, pretty much everybody who didn't have vertical protection is now qualified for this new one. Okay. Now, there are two important points about that. First, unlike the previous vertical reservations, which were intended as you know, compensatory and reparatory provision for past marginalization, this new reservation is awarded based on transient individual characteristic. So you are not, you may be born poor, but you don't need to uh, stay poor. Or you might be born rich and you might go poor, right? So it's a transient characteristics. Whereas if you are Dalit, you're a member of scheduled caste, you know, you're Dalit all your life, right? So the end, uh, so is it, Make sense, is it plausible to award this very strong form of affirmative action based on a transient characteristics? That's not something I can answer. Okay. But it's debated a lot, and so, so, and the base, I think, continue. Okay. I will not have too much to say about that. Okay. However, I will say a lot about this third purple dot. In a very controversial decision, the amendment made sure that EWS reservations only apply to people who do not qualify for other vertical reservations, thereby 
making sure that my theorem with Bominian mass is still correct, uniqueness theorem. So it's great this one, right? My, uh, you know, my uniqueness result is still valid in India, right? But I don't like what they did, right? And especially the way it happened. So that's what this lecture is all about. So basically after 2019, it is still true that vertical reservations are non-overlapping, but now it doesn't happen naturally. It is legislation and court enforced. So what's the time? As, seen, as soon as uh, EWS, uh, the amendment passed, uh, it was challenged by several groups. In August 2020, the case eventually elevated to a five judge constitutional bench of the Supreme Court. So it was first at high court, uh, I think several different groups, uh, you know, filed the litigation. They got combined and then they moved the three judge bench and the three judge bench uh, decided that, okay, these complaints are serious enough. Uh, one challenge with, you know, uh, a litigation against a constitutional amendment is the bar is very high because of separation of powers. But so this passed through the Congress, the amendment. So you're not suing just an individual institution. Uh, you're not even suing just a government, uh, local state government. You are suing uh, the entire you know, constitutional amendment, right? So the bar for that is very high. And in India, Uh, the, the objection receives serious consideration and it can be accepted. The constitutional amendment can be revoked only if it is found to contradict the basic structure of the Indian constitution. Okay. And uh, what the three judge bench decided this, indeed, it is possible that the basic structure might be compromised, but the three judge uh, bench cannot make that decision. It's not big enough. Uh, the constitution bench needs to have at least five judges of the Supreme Court, okay? So, so that's why it's elevated. So, so that's what that process is. So in September 2022, and when this was happening, Uku and I were working on this problem. Okay. And uh, we already had uh, you know, some results. Uh, and you know, one of our big points was you cannot really exclude these groups, uh, but you got to do more than that so that there is no loophole. So we had a version of the paper, you know, some of our students knew about the project, uh, uh, but we had other priorities and uh, we didn't have anything circulated. So, so in September, 2022, uh, one of our students, Don Shukhanna, uh, sent an email to us and told us that, do you know that uh, the case actually, the hearings will start? And it is so important. It is, will be the first uh, Supreme Court judgment and uh, excuse me hearings that will be live online. It's a historical. Uh, so we got very excited, and we started following uh, the hearings. I think there were like eight hearings, and in that. Already in the hearing, something very interesting happened. So like in the paper, like before September 2022, we were making 
you know, some suggestions. And one of the suggestions was, you know, you cannot exclude, you know, people who are eligible from other uh, reparatory uh, VR, protected, VR protections from uh, EWS, just doesn't make sense. Uh, and the issues were already apparent. I will show you what the issues were. Like, for instance, the cutoffs for EWS was systematically lower than cutoffs for some of the VR protected groups, which means you can be a member of a discriminated group. You can be even more poor and you can have a higher score and yet lose a position to a privileged person who is poor, but not as much as you. And uh, because they have lower score. Clearly that's not what affirmative action intends, right? So this was already happened. Okay. So we were like, the first thing that you should do is you can, you need, you cannot continue they shouldn't continue with the non-overlapping structure. So, so, but then this introduces multiplicity. And at the time, uh, we weren't thinking that carefully about uh, informed neutrality. And we were, we had one of the policies that I will discuss. And I think Manchu will know this uh, a bit of that. So he alerted us. And like a few days after he alerted, the hearing started. And uh, the Supreme Court announced what will be decided by the court. Okay. There were four main items uh, before this announcement. One of them is dropped. And in these judgments, what happens is the justices first formulate what they will decide, okay? And what they will decide is the following. Can reservations be granted solely on the basis of economic criteria? And this is not something you know, I'm qualified to comment on. I can only analyze the implications of that, right? Uh, so, Second question was, can states provide reservations in private educational institutions which do not receive governmental aid? So interestingly, the EWS reservation was provided even at private institutions, even though the other ones uh, do not uh, apply to at uh, uh, private. So this is also not relevant to our discussion, right? But interesting that the third question that is asked was, are EWS reservations constitutionally invalid, meaning does it actually contradict with the basic structure uh, for excluding socioeconomically uh, backward uh, classes from its law? So literally they themselves ask, you know, one of the suggestions uh, we were making anyway. So, so, so this already appeared as uh, one of the aspects of the uh, judgment uh, or hearings. Okay. So during the hearings, so this lasted about, I think close, to, I think there were eight hearings over maybe three weeks. Uh, advocates for the petitioners, repeatedly argued that the amendment violates the equality code, which corresponds to roughly articles uh, 14 to 18 in Indian constitution by excluding, uh, you know, scheduled caste, scheduled tribes and OBCs. And very interestingly, in the very last hearing, I think that was the eighth hearing, in order to address this issue, an advocate for uh, the plaintiffs, Professor Dr. Uh, Mohango Pal, who's a renowned uh, constitutional scholar, uh, suggested a compromise that does not involve striking down the entire amendment. 
So he said, don't, you know, drop the amendment, except do not exclude, you know, scheduled, scheduled tribes or BCs from the scope, right? Which was, you know, one of our proposals anyways, uh, like uh, at that time in the paper that we were writing with the Okay, so technical part of this presentation is, is about the implications and implementation of this compromise policy. So if India were to follow this compromise policy, you know, what would happen or what could happen? How could it be implemented? And importantly, once you have, it, once you follow it, the non-overlapping structure of vertical reservations is no longer valid, right? Of course, uh, lawyers, judges, they don't think carefully about this, right? So they might not know that this technical aspect might have big implications, but they do, okay? Which cause lots of confusion, actually, uh, in the decision. So, immediately, first of all, before a decision came, before a decision came, we, I mean, we already had many results. Uh, we just, you know, included the September hearings into our narrative. And our expectations was that the amendment would go and this compromise would go through. Right? That's what we expected. Why? Well, because there are five judges and two of them were active in the hearings. Like two of them kept asking questions, okay? And always about this point. Those two justices included the, the Chief Justice of India, Uday Lali, and also Justice Bhatt, uh, Rahindra Bhatt, I think. And I thought they would strike it because they were among the, they were among the justices who corrected the issue with the horizontal reservations. So I knew that these two justices keep asking these questions. Uh, I kind of knew, you know, what they think like, and I knew that they are very sophisticated, uh, right? They already fixed that big issue. So my expectation was, you know, they will also fix this one, except because of this overlapping, there will be a huge loophole in the system. So that's what I was worried, right? So uh, the uniqueness will no longer be true and the multiplicity, it will be quite significant as you'll see, okay? So that was my expectation. So we circulated the first version of our paper, I think in October, uh, 2022. And I actually published uh, also the, uh, an op-ed uh, in the Hindu uh, a week before the uh, uh, verdict with Professor Deshmande. Uh, who's a renowned uh, scholar in the reservation system in India. Okay. To our surprise, in a landmark judgment, Janit Abhyan, what we expected didn't happen. Okay. The constitutional bench upheld the constitutional amendment. So, the bench deemed the amendment valid. The decision was not unanimous. It was reaching a three to split verdict. Okay. 
In a very rare occurrence, the two dissents included the Chief Justice of India. So this is very rare, apparently. That's what I'm reading. What's also interesting is that was the last day of the Chief Justice of India. That was his last decision. Then he retired. Okay. And it is viewed by many as a judgment that fundamentally changed the role of affirmative action in India. Uh, and I agree with that viewpoint, and you'll see why. Okay. Now, of the three questions, all justices agreed that reservations can be granted on the basis of economic criteria. There was no controversy. Okay. So nobody objected. So you can have uh, EWS. So that's no problem. And they didn't talk much about the second point about private institutions. Like uh, that point seemed like a detail in the entire judgment. Okay. However, the two dissents strongly disagreed with the majority justices on the constitutionality of the exclusion of the uh, scheduled cast, scheduled tribes, and OBCs from EWS. Uh, so how strongly they descended? Uh, let me illustrate. So see, so this was very big news in India. And remember, this was the first Supreme Court judgment, which was uh, online, uh, or live online, right? Uh, it's basically history for them, okay? And you can see the extent of disagreement in the opening paragraph, in paragraph one of the descending opinion by Justice Ravindra Bhatt. Okay? So he says, and so descending opinion, the Chief Justice didn't give any opinion. He just said, I agree with everything. So basically, uh, the opinion by uh, Justice uh, Ravindra Bhatt also re uh, represents uh, Justice, uh, Chief Justice's opinion. I regret my inability to concur with the views expressed by the majority opinion on the validity of the 103rd Amendment on question number three, since I feel for reasons set out elaborately in the following opinion that this court has for the first time in seven, seven decades of the Republic Sanction them along with the exclusionary and discriminatory principle. Our constitution does not speak the language of exclusion. In my considered opinion, the amendment by the language of exclusion undermines the fabric of social justice and thereby the basic structure. Okay, so basically they're saying this is the worst decision of this nature in seven decades. Right. Okay. So while the verdict was declared as a major victory for the, the central government led by uh, Prime Minister Modi, according to many media outlets, it also created an uproar in the uh, country. For example, let me read one of them. It's constitutionally perverse that the compelling need for measures to address social backwardness had uh, become justification for the exclusion of backward classes from measures to address economic uh, deprivation. India's most marginalized sections that comprise of a significant portion and much higher portion actually of India's poor stand excluded from reservation meant for the poor. And it is now easier, far easier to provide reservation for this narrow reconstructed uh, EWS then it is to, uh, to do the same for India's most marginalized sections. So effectively, with the political move, they made it a lot easier for privileged groups to receive a position compared to discriminated groups, right? Uh, you know, as was seen with the cutoffs in you know competitive exams and stuff like that. So, so what? were the majority justices thinking? Okay, so why did they give that decision? 
they are actually not unsympathetic to the position of the dissents. So they're saying, okay, what you're saying makes it. it they're saying it looks like it makes sense. Okay, so let me read what they're saying. Rather, according to the petitioners, the classes covered by articles, blah, blah, blah. So basically, schedule class, schedule tribes, OBC, are comprising of the poorest of the poor, and hence, keeping them out of the benefit of EWS reservation is an exercise uh, conceptually at conflict with the constitutional norms and principles. Okay. So, majority just start saying that. The other people, you know, the sons are saying this. That's what they are saying. Then they say, at the first blush, the arguments made in this regard appear to be having some substance because it cannot be denied that the classes covered by articles, you know, blah, blah, would also be comprising of two persons within. However, a little pause and a closer look makes it clear that the grievance of the petitioners because of this exclusion remains entirely untenable and the challenge to the amendment in questions remains wholly unsustainable. As noticed in front, there is a definitive logic to this exclusion. Rather, this exclusion is inevitable for the true operation and effect of the scheme of EWS reservation. So what the majority justices are claiming is the following. They are saying, okay, we are sympathetic to that perspective. Surely, you know, schedule cost, schedule tribes, so obviously they are even more poor maybe, right? So we, they say, yeah, I agree with that, okay? And because of this, it looks like they are, objection seems to have substance. But then they are trying to make a mathematical proof. They're claiming that this exclusion was inevitable. So, so basically what they're saying is this exclusion was made out of necessity for otherwise EWS reservation wouldn't do its purpose. Okay, that's what they are claiming. Now, why they make this argument? So why do majority justices think like that? You know, all of this, by the way, shows that, you know, we need a seat on that take on these discussions. That's my point. These arguments are completely analytical. And at this level of complexity requires formalization. Otherwise, stuff like this happens. That's my major point, right? So the majority justice over the following technical justification for their alleged necessity of the exclusion. So they are not teaching. The moment there is vertical reservation, exclusion is the vital requisite to provide benefit to the target group. In fact, the affirmative action of reservation for a particular target group to achieve its desired result has to be carved out by the exclusion of others. So the majority just are claiming that if you do have overlapping reservations, the new group cannot benefit. Others get too much. As a result, there has to be a partition. That's a technical claim. Yes. Is there any input from someone like like economists or some someone like that, uh, uh, other than this judge themselves? Uh, I mean, uh, I don't think I don't think justices consult. I don't think justices know that uh, there are scholars 
who think about these problems at okay, this level. Maybe, yeah, no, yeah. And uh, I don't believe there were any before, you know, we got interested in uh, these problems. Now, so, guess, but, uh, so it's also entirely possible that the whole thing is political and these are just excuses. You know, this cannot be denied. Indeed, many believe. But the thing is, the point that I'm making is whether this is political or not, the justification I can disprove. And I will disprove. Okay. So, they didn't, uh, they didn't so, so they didn't do a good job uh, with the excuse, if this was an excuse. But given that this is one of the most significant judgments in 70 years, uh, you know, I think this needs to be discussed. Then the justice co continue, but for this exclusion, if you don't have the exclusion, the purported affirmative action for a particular class or a group would be congenitally deformative and shall fail at its inception. It means if you don't do exclusion, it, it, it uh, dies at birth, right? It becomes useless. Therefore, the claim of any particular class or section against its exclusion from the affirmative action of reservation in favor of EWS has to be rejected. Okay. Basically, and then he, they continue, it could be easily seen that, like, you know, when you, you have proofs and the author says it can be easily seen in the proof is usually wrong, right? Uh, like that's where you find most of the mistakes. Stuff that can be easily seen, they're often wrong, right? That's also the case here. It could be easily seen that, but for this exclusion, the entire balance of the general principles of equality and compensatory discrimination would be disturbed with extra or excessive advantage being given to classes already availing the benefits on the, you know, uh, the earlier reservations. Okay. So basically, let's summarize this. And by the way, this is the entire justification. There's no additional justification. Five paragraphs of the majority opinion which gives the proof of the necessity, which is absolutely false. Okay, which I'll show. Yes. So I, I guess whether this can be done together with uh, uh, schedule casting it seems to actually needs quite serious analysis, right? Like, like it, it is very serious analysis, uh, as you will see. Yeah. As a related matter, but somewhat maybe a bit related to your pandemic paper too, but the Perhaps a, a conceptual idea would be to add points to you know each of these characteristics, like rise uh, in the priority score and so on. Was that even discussed there, or, or do you know what, so, what they, whether so they even these have judgments cannot discuss this you know policies okay. which only... are not part of the lawsuit. I see, they, 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 and because there is that. like you know, many, many years of, you know, like, I mean, there are laws, right? Mm -hmm. And so maybe the there's a structure. Yeah. So uh, they, they cannot make this. They cannot make it. Uh, they cannot, they cannot give this decision. Right. So before, before that, in the uh, legal, like when, when they are making a law like this, did they even think about these points? Uh, so oh. there is one judgment where one of the uh, justices made a personal opinion, which is not part of the decision. Mm -hmm. And they suggested that perhaps for OBC, you should just add 10 points. Oh, I see, I see. That okay, was, uh... but that's not part of the judgment. And this point is kind of misinterpreted uh, by the authors uh, who work on this uh, uh, problem. Uh, so they interpret this as the, their reservation policy, which is basically soft reserves. First, it's a different policy, adding 10 points. And second, uh, this is not part of the judgment. Uh, this is actually, it's kind of like, it's not exactly dissenting opinion, but 
this is personal opinion, a wish for the future. Like uh, that justice was suggesting, you know, vertical reservations with hard reserves uh, for other backwards costs is too much. Like nobody questions scheduled cost vertical reservation as scheduled tribes. OBC was added later on, and they weren't as discriminated as scheduled cost and scheduled tribes. So, so that's what you're asking, right? So that policy is, at least it was broad for a particular uh, category, but uh, never became the law or never became part of the actual decision. See, that's interesting because in, in a pandemic paper, my recollection is that, well, that was uh, considered, but uh, your point was that it's part of your point seems that, uh, well, these are not uh, really attainable. I mean, that, that, that has its own problem. So once but, again, uh, I mean, if medical ethicists find a way to do that, they can do. So it's kind of like, uh, you know, this Chinese policy where you had, uh, you know, 10 points, for increased tuition for a party, mm -hmm. for a, uh, some positions. Uh, so it can definitely be done, but there will be multiplicities. And uh, but then we can also study the implications of the multiplicities, so on and so forth. Certainly interesting analytical question, but that's not feasible currently in the country. So to summarize, the entire justification of the majority justices for their support of the exclusion is based on two related technical arguments made in paragraph 79 to 82 of the majority opinion. They argue that the exclusion of the beneficiaries of earlier provisions from a new provision is absolutely necessary to be able to deliver any benefit to groups who are outside the scope of earlier provisions. They also argue that uh, inclusion of scheduled cast scheduled tribes and OBC to the scope of EWS reservation would necessarily result in excessive advantage to the members of these classes. They refer that as they will receive double benefits, right? Okay. And, and indeed, you can see that discussion here. Okay. We are not doing it because there will be double benefits. And then, you know, the others wouldn't get anything meaningful. That's the argument. So, what's going on? So as I'll present in the formal analysis next, both of these points are absolutely false. Like it's not that maybe false. They're absolutely false. More precisely, while the technical justification offered by the majority justices would be accurate, under non-overlapping vertical reservations. So if vertical reservations have to be non-overlapping necessarily, then it would be necessarily correct. But that structure is under discussion by the justices, right? They are, essentially the mistake they are making is the following. They are questioning one assumption if you wish, the overlapping structure. And they, they're making a proof based on the earlier structure. So there's nothing with a contradiction. So basically they are working under the wrong model, basically, right? They don't understand their own problem. And I mean, uh, maybe they say a little bit harsh, but uh, I mean, this is technically highly sophisticated uh, setting, right? Uh, this is not something that can be completely resolved by using zero formalism whatsoever. They need Fujita to solve this problem. So as such, the technical justification offered by the majority justices for their controversial decision is entirely due to their oversight of the implications of overlapping vertical reservations, a technical and subtle phenomenon the justices are simply not familiar with, right? So that's why we need to be a part of these discussions. 
So now I will make all these points uh, formally. What I'll do is I will completely ignore horizontal reservations for today for two reasons. The discussions themselves didn't talk at all about horizontal reservations. So the entire debate, uh, because horizontal reservations are secondary, uh, it wasn't discussed. Okay. I will give three policies and I'll give them justifications, different justifications. Okay. The more realistic ones, one will be aligned with majority view. So if I take majority opinion seriously, their concerns, but correct mistakes nonetheless, then I will have one solution. If I take the concerns of dissident justices, I will have another solution. These two solutions and their results completely extend with horizontal reservation. It's just the proof is hard. But 100% makes sense. So I'm not hiding it. The, we have also give a third solution, which Kenzo and Fujito will especially like, a more technocratic solution, okay? but maybe less realistic because it's, uh, but conceptually it might appeal actually as a compromise. Uh, we can talk a little bit about that. That result doesn't extend as it is because there will be multiplicities. So you can, you need to make additional assumptions. So what I mean is you can extend that result too but not in a unique way. It can be done in multiple ways. Okay. So uh, horizontal reservations uh, is not overseen here, even though it's not discussed in the uh, uh, judgments. I mean, when I was writing the paper, even before the judgments, uh, judgment was made, like I mentioned that, you know, we were already working on this before the hearings, we were solving it with horizontal reservations. Why? Because if our idea is accepted at the end, even though it's not discussed in the uh, judgment itself, uh, institutions will need to implement together with horizontal reservations, right? Uh, so that's why we also have that uh, in the paper, but now in, it's in the uh, appendix because it really became a secondary point uh, given the decision. So this is pretty much a similar model. So I'll go very fast uh, for parts of this. Uh, we have two sigma positions. I is the set of all individuals. Each individual is in the form position. This is the same model, but a little bit simpler because uh, I will ignore horizontal reservations. Uh, for the presentation. Uh, EWS reservations, the VR policy, and following the discussions in India, uh, we just focus on VR policy. As we mentioned yesterday, so this is exactly the same thing uh, as yesterday, uh, vertical reservations is banished through category memberships. Calligraphic R is set of reserve eligible categories. For example, scheduled cast, scheduled tri tribes, OBC, EWS. Uh, in principle, you know, there cannot be overlap between scheduled cast, scheduled tribes, or OBC, but unless you enforce it, there will be overlaps between EWS and the other ones. Okay. Uh, each individual I belongs to possibly empty set of reserve eligible categories row I, okay? And I, for my abstract analysis, I allow that an individual may participate in multiple, uh, may be a member of 
multiple vertical reservations. Okay, so, uh, and if it is the case that no individual is beneficiary of more than one vertical reservation, I will call this non-overlapping VR protections. If there is at least one person who benefits from multiple VR protections, I will refer to this as overlapping VR protections. Okay. So this is exactly the same you know, definitions as yesterday. QC is the number of category C positions set aside for reserve eligible category C. Uh, QO is the number of open positions uh, which are unattached. Uh, uh, v is the category for positions. So it includes reserve eligible categories plus the open category. And uh, so we used to call this IO yesterday. Now I will call EO. Uh, uh, these are the people eligible for these categories. For the open category, everybody is eligible. For reserve eligible category C, only their members are uh, eligible. Okay. I don't need to repeat, uh, everybody was here yesterday, right? So a single category choice rule, a choice rule and aggregate choice rule, they are exactly what they are. Basically a single category cho choice rule is the standard choice rule in the literature. From each set of applicants, it picks a set of eligible individuals. A choice rule is multidimensional. It does the same thing for multiple categories, but of course, you cannot receive positions from multiple categories. And when I take the union of all individuals who are selected at all categories, that I will refer to as aggregate choice. And uh, I don't need to talk about mandates of Saurav Yadal because in the absence of horizontal reservations, uh, Indra Sani's judgments and mandates are already well defined and they already give a uh, unique uh, outcome, unique solution when there is no overlap in VR protected categories. Okay. So uh, we talked about that yesterday. And uh, and the remark is about the correction made by Saurav Yadam judgment. Okay, so basically, the remark is about yesterday's uh, lecture, lecture three. So let me repeat the axioms. These are not new axioms. These are exactly the axioms that we talked about yesterday, except they are simpler, much simpler, because there are no horizontal reservations. So basically, I will discuss the axioms under Indra Sun. First of all, one of the axioms become irrelevant, you know, uh, complies with horizontal reservations. Uh, so there are only three axioms, and but they are also simpler. A choice rule is non baseful if no matter which individual, which set of individuals I pick, which vertical category I pick, and which individual J I pick, if J is unmatched, while there is an unmatched uh, position at category V, then it could, then it must be the case that individual J is simply ineligible for that position. A choice rule satisfies no justifier than V if, no matter which set of individuals I pick, which category I pick, which individuals selected for category B positions, and another agent J who was eligible for category V and yet is not selected for any position. So basically, Anmashka, even though he was eligible, so in particular, J can be envious of I, 
right? Except this envy wouldn't be justified because sigma uh, i has higher score than. Basically, whenever you have i and j and a category v like this, then it necessarily has to be the case that i has higher merit than j. For otherwise, j's objection would be legitimate, right? Very, so, and uh, this is, uh, you know, just much simpler version of uh, yesterday's axiom. Uh, yesterday, you were also able to discern true horizontal benefits, whereas uh, today is not possible uh, in that we don't need vertical reservations. And uh, the condition, the last condition is also much simpler uh, without horizontal reservations. A choice rule C complies with VR protections if no matter which set of individuals I pick, which individual I, I select uh, in that group, and which reserve category I, R I pick, if individual I is given a reserve position at category C and thereby not given an open position. So I have an individual I who is given a reserve position. Then it must be the case that first, all open positions are full. And second, everybody who is given open position, they must have higher score, right? Much simpler version of yesterday's axiom. So if I take yesterday's axiom, assume that horizontal reservations are zero, number of horizontal reservations are zero. That's exactly what you get. Okay. So uh, we have protections have always been non overlapping in India, and it still is, unfortunately. Uh, until 2019, due to cost system, since 2019, due to cost system and controversial exclusion. Now, we formulated the following uh, choice rule uh, in a paper where we uh, showed a mistake in Boston public schools, actually. They uh, kind of got rid of votes on priority unintentionally, uh, right? So over and about choice rule, uh, there is subtle difference when I, when we speak of uh, choice rule in that paper, it wasn't multidimensional. So, uh, so it, so we were just talking about aggregate choice rule in that context, whereas uh, because this additional structure was irrelevant there, uh, whereas here. This additional structure is very important. Uh, subject, of course, uh, any multidimensional choice rule induces an aggregate ch uh, choice rule, uh, except uh, it was only that aspect which was discussed in the literature. And I think this is almost always the case in other uh, theoretical papers both in economics literature and uh, CS literature. But otherwise, what is over and above choice rule? Well, in step one, you allocate open positions to high, highest merit ranking individuals. And in step two, for each VR protected uh, group, you allocate the reserve positions to highest merit ranking members of the group who remain honest. Now, assuming non-overlapping VR protection. So, so let's, for now, let's assume that there are no overlaps. So let's maintain the assumption in India. And uh, let's ignore horizontal reservations. Uh, Supreme Court mandates on VR policy are uniquely implemented with the over and about choice rule. Okay. So basically this, when there are no overlaps, uh, basically, it's a much simpler case of our characterization result with Bominianas, right? Much easier version 
if no individual belongs to multiple VR protected categories, that a choice will satisfy non baselessness, no justified enemy, and complies with VR protections if and only if it's the over and above choice. So, uh, uh, very simple corollary of yesterday's main characterization. Okay. But now we are talking about overlapping VR protections. What happens with overlapping VR protections? And first of all, why is this question relevant? Well, if the controversial exclusion is removed, you automatically have overlapping VR protections. Overlapping in a particular way. You know, an individual can be uh, a member of two categories at most, two reserved categories, one of which has to be EWS, right? That's the structure. So it turns out that given in Rasani, whether VR protections are overlapping or not is immaterial for allocation of open positions. Okay. So even if you have overlapping reservations and even in ways that's different than uh, the, what EWS would require, the assignment of open positions will not change under intrasound mandates, okay? So, so basically, fix any profile of category memberships row, another profile row prime of category memberships that is non-overlapping. So basically, row can have overlapping. Row prime, is not overlapping. I'm having this raw prime, which is non overlapping, because I will relate things to over and above, but over and above is only defined for non overlapping. That's why I have two membership structures here. Okay. So what's the relation between row and row prime again? Uh, there's there's no relation. Just an arbitrary pair. They, they are arbitrary. They are arbitrary. They are arbitrary. Okay. Uh, okay. So, but now look at the overlapping structure. And suppose it satisfies intrasamism mandates. Then for any set of individuals, the set of individuals assigned to open positions is exactly the same as over and above open assignments under any non-overlapping prior to structure. So basically, all that's saying is the assignment of all open positions doesn't change, no matter what you do, unless you change the number of open positions, right? Yeah, actually, like, actually that, that story evaded my question. So I, I think I'm like, missing some something here. So um so suppose that the row was some non-overlapping um uh, category membership and uh row prime um is such that let's say nobody is given the, the membership to any category. Right, and does it still hold? Of course, and because we are talking about open positions. You always have to give open positions to highest uh, score people. Oh, so, oh, so, okay. Let so this is only that. for open positions. Oh, I see. So uh, am I right then? Uh, you're saying that even if you change the uh, uh, category membership uh, function, uh, you keep the uh, position of uh, each uh, each category the same here. No, of course, I'm not. Uh, so, 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 of course, uh, I'm assuming that uh, we are economists, right? So, yeah, so I, 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 I'm, I'm not, I'm not making any changes in anything else. Okay, so I, I, I basically wanted to basically get clarification. So, so you have this model in which you have 
uh, category and uh, uh, capacity for each category and so on. And that is that is the same, of course. Yeah, of course. And uh, you are only, course. The only thing that's changing is membership, right? And all this is saying is very simple lemma. Uh, like there is a much to debate about open positions. That's what this is saying, unless you change the number of positions. So, so fine. Open positions don't need to change anyways. Why not simply allocate VR protected positions also as an over and above choice? Right? Why not? Now, first of all, for starters, step two of over and above is no longer uniquely defined. What was over and above? You first allocate open positions. Then for each VR protected group, you allocate the reserve positions to highest ranking members of the group who remain on the side. Now, when VR protected groups were non-overlapping, you know, this was, you know, making uh, allocations in parallel for several categories. So this is uniquely defined. But now that there are overlaps, this is not valuable. You can use different sequences. You can allocate them maybe together, right? Uh, you know, that's where you know, my paper with Scott Cominers becomes relevant, you know, the concept of precedence. So over and above choice rule is not uniquely defined. There are multiple ways to do this. There are multiple extensions of over and above when VR protections are overlapping. So why not just process them sequentially? That gives me a class of extensions of over and above. Okay. And we'll do that. OK. So let sigma, no, what is this? Not sigma, delta. Let delta be all orders of presence, meaning all potential sequences of categories. Meaning you first process maybe schedule cast, then open category, then OBC. Okay. Delta O are the more relevant ones, you start by open. And indeed, the lemma says that you have to do it that way, right? So these are the relevant ones. So delta O E is open first, EWS last orders of precedences. So basically you start with open, Finish with EWS and then do whatever in between. And the next one, you start with open and continue with EWS. You can potentially do also other stuff, right? But these are the classes that I will focus on. They will be the relevant ones for our purposes. You'll see why. Okay. Then I can define the following class of choice rules. What do you do? So these are the kind of choice rules we defined in the pandemic resource allocation uh, paper. So you basically allocate positions category by category, one at a time, uh, starting with the highest presence category and then next one, so on so forth, okay? So that's sequential rules. Okay, now, first of all, if I wanna generalize over and above, I have to start with open category, right? Otherwise, the rule will not be legal. It will contradict in the summary. So I have to say, so for me, the relevant class of presidents are these ones.
I will speak of EWS last over and above and EWS first over and above mechanisms. It's clear what these are, right? So basically, you put all categories in a sequence. In the first class, you start with open and end with EWS, and the others are ranked in any way. And then fill those positions one at a time to highest merit eligible individuals. And the second one is similar, except you start with open and then continue with EWS. Now, the lemma is actually there is no difference between any two member of either this class, like there is no difference between the outcomes of EWS last over and above between themselves. Same thing for EWS first over and above. So in that sense, EWS last over and above is a well-defined statement. The sequence of, you know, the ones in the middle, schedule class, schedule trait among themselves doesn't matter. Okay, so that's a lemma. Okay, now, about the Indian laws. For as long as I start with the open category, any sequential choice rule satisfies all mandates of Indra Sal. Indeed, even if you don't start with open, it still satisfies non wastefulness and not just by then, but to satisfy compliance with VR protections, then you have to start with uh, open. Okay? Very simple. Which means the main challenge under overlapping VR protections is not the difficulty of satisfying the mandates of Supreme Court, but rather the multiplicity of the choice rules which do. You know, we have several legal possibilities. Okay. Is this a big deal? But historically, economists, once they solve a problem, uh, you know, uh, end of the problem, right? I'll suggest that this is a very big deal. I'll suggest that it's a very big deal. So let's make a back of the envelope calculation. I'll make a very simple calculation. Assumption uh, under three assumptions. Suppose that any individual who is not a member of a cost based category is eligible for EWS reservation. So basically, suppose all members of the old general category, they're all eligible for EWS. Well, that's not a very bad assumption anyway. So I can remember this was a very political decision. So the government made sure that the, relation, uh, the requirements are kind of uh, simple to satisfy. According to Deshpande and uh, Ramachandran, 2019, 98% of them are eligible. And maybe the other 2% might not even apply for government jobs. Right? Uh, so assumption one is the extremely safe assumption for the distribution. Assumption two is also, there is no excess demand, uh, there is excess demand from all groups. Yeah, these positions are, you know, there's the lot of competition. That's why there is all this tension. Okay. And assumption three might not be reasonable, but just for illustration, because I'll make a very striking uh, point. Suppose there is no difference between merit score distributions of groups, right? So I'm not, in a way, I'm making an observation independent of who does better in the exams or what. So I, I'm a little surprised uh, that as much as 98% of these people are eligible for EWS because I thought you said uh, only 10% of the positions are reserved for these people. That's right. So and that's I mean that uh, we are talking about some elite colleges, elite positions in government where 
that everything so the motive is sabotaging the affirmative action system uh, for cost based uh, for repertory and compensatory so this whole thing is uh, kind of like a well, are you kind of suggesting that maybe the point maybe the, the point is just, this so this this happened before Indian elections okay. amen so this is uh, I mean, many argue that this was to get the votes of general category by the Modi government. Like many, meaning pretty much everybody uh, was not in general category, oh, and so many of them too. So, so yeah, it is a like defining, giving reservation for the poor, and then deeming everybody poor. It's kind of like an interesting uh, choice, right? Okay. 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 Let's make a simple proposition. I'm calling this proposition, but it's obvious. I will compare the outcome of EWS last over and above and EWS first over and above under these assumptions. And I'm not making any wild, crazy assumption here, right? So, I mean, assumption three is not maybe completely uh, realistic, but it doesn't uh, uh, push the outcome to one way or another in a uh, very particularly meaningful way. So, and this is an illustration anyways, that's not the main reason. So let me compare EWS last and EWS first over and above choice rules, okay? Under these assumptions, the outcome of the EWS last over and above choice rule is the same as the outcome of the over and above choice rule with EWS reservation and the exclusion. Meaning the outcome of the controversial policy. So under these assumptions, if you choose EWS last, nothing will change. In practice, it will change because probably assumption three will not hold, right? But basically, so this, the point is EWS last is very close to what they are doing anyways. That's the point. What about EWS first over and above choice? Well, the outcome of that one is same as the outcome of the over and above choice rule, so without EWS reservation at the first place. So basically the difference between the two is the whole effect of the amendment, right? So this is a big deal, it's very big deal. And importantly, with this observation alone, I can immediately say that, the technical claims why the majority justices in Janhid Abhiyan on the necessity of exclusion are false under the EWS last over and above choice rule. Like, I didn't suggest that what they are saying is uniformly wrong in under any mechanism consistent with the law because they are making a statement about it was needed. So they claim that there doesn't exist any reasonable resolution, right? So basically what I'm saying is the justices, if they were technically savvy, but still political, they could have just picked this one, right? The outcome wouldn't be too different but there wouldn't be outrage, right? Because there's no exclusion anymore. Even though the outcome is not too different, in some cases, exactly the same. In particular, whenever there's no cutoff this uh, controversy, like I mentioned that EWS cutoff was lower than OBC, like whenever that wouldn't happen, that kind of very visible issue doesn't happen, the outcome would be exactly the same. So they could have gotten what they wanted, without all that trouble, an outcome 
So, uh, except, uh, you know, they didn't have a, an evil version of me in the table there. And, uh, uh, okay. So, so basically this immediately tells that individuals from EWS who are ineligible for earlier cost-based protections are still the primary beneficiaries of the EWS reservation. Why? Well, because when you do EWS last, by the time you are allocating EWS positions, like people from scheduled cost, relatively high point ones are kind of gone uh, because of the scheduled cost position, so on and so forth, right? So uh, those who are only eligible for EWS would be at an advantage for quite a while, probably uh, for all the positions. And definitely the policy does not generate excessive benefits to individual eligible for task-based VR protections. Under that assumption, under this assumption, it doesn't provide any benefit to that. So uh, I have some clarification questions. So uh, um so does this um for position mean that the uh in the EWS last without exclusion uh, choice? Actually, nobody is nobody from these other uh, categories will be actually uh, admitted at uh, it is uh, only under these assumptions. But the thing is, right, and I'm trying unless to... unless the application is such that it is in the news because of the cutoffs, these assumptions would hold. So basically. In all situations where there wasn't a very visible issue, which is in the news, the outcome exactly the same. And essentially, essentially, one can view EWS last as a method which gives all the much of the benefits to, to the in, to the general category anyways but without creating all that controversy yeah, so one thing i'm trying to still understand is um do you have any assumption as to so which assumptions probably um so do you have some assumption as to like how many positions are available for other categories as well? Because no, the, no, there's no, so it's independent. But this is not the main analysis, by the way. Let me, uh, uh, I will analyze EWS last uh, more carefully. Remember, this is back of the envelope calculation. Yeah, yeah, yeah. But, but I'm, I'm still not completely sure. Uh, so, uh, so suppose that uh, there's no, uh, uh, no position for any other categories except for EWS. Nothing is resolved for them. In that case, the it looks as if that uh, uh, this actually matters. And why why that is not wrong? I mean, there's, even if you have an EWS at the last, say, um, I thought that the big so let's look at other categories will be still admitted uh, for the EWS with uh, seats. Um, but with the exclusion, they are not. So, uh, sorry, I missed something here. So, what is the what is the claim again? Uh, so, uh, suppose the uh, suppose the case in which um, this seat. Uh, uh, Result for categories is zero except okay. for EWS, mm -hmm. right? And so there's only open category seats and the EWS uh, category. Uh, with exclusion, uh, some people from this uh, uh, non-general uh, category people will only get uh, will get all open positions, and then with exclusion, nobody will get the uh, EWS positions. That's right. Uh, without uh, exclusion. I would have thought that the uh, these people who are not general category people would still get some seats. So you seem to be suggesting that if all scheduled cast positions are zero, uh, you might have a counter example. Let's see what will happen in that particular okay, case. Okay, that's right. right. Let's do that. So suppose there is no vertical reservation for other categories. 
what does EWS loss over and above choice rule in that case? So in that scenario, without the reform, there are only open positions, right? With the reform, you do the follow. You only had open positions at the beginning. Some of them went to EWS and only them. I don't see a contradiction. I mean, it's uh, it's a simpler version of the same argument, right? So, like the outcome of an EWS loss over F about choice rule, even in that case, same as the outcome of the over and about choice rule with EWS reservation and the exclusion, even the mechanics is the same actually, right? Maybe I actually miss it. So, so this EP EWS reservation and exclusion means. Firstly, you uh, allocate open positions to every well everyone according to this merit score, and for the EWS reservation, uh, only these people who are. I think the confusion might be the following. So, with this reform amendment, number of open positions decreased by the same amount of. EWS reservation. Mm -hmm. So EWS positions came from open positions. Yep. Mm -hmm. So if there weren't any other vertical reservations, in one sense, like, like without the reform, everything was open. Actually, I mean, in that scenario, by the way, uh, I'm now also getting confused. So, by the way, this is not in the paper. This is, like I said, the back of the envelope calculation. But uh, let me see if I'm making a mistake in the back of the envelope. Uh, can we discuss actually yeah, given yeah, the time? Sorry, yeah, Let's I, I discuss it at the end. So, I want to make sure I'm not making a mistake okay. here. It's just, I was just making an illustration. That's the main, not main result. Uh, it's possible that I might be also uh, having an oversight in the, uh, the I will check that out. Uh, but so, this is the op-ed we wrote right before the decision. And my worry was they will get rid of the inclusion, uh, exclusion, but will not do any additional suggestion because like most people wouldn't see, know the diff, uh, you know, implication of that. And there would be a huge loophole in the system. And we wanted to avoid this, and this got lots of uh, publicity in India actually at the time. So it got lots of attention. Okay. Now, so the amount, uh, the amendment allows for a financial deprived member of a forward class to receive a position with a low merit score, while it denies the same position for an even more financial deprived member of a disadvantaged class who has higher merit score. So obviously this cannot be justified either by affirmative action or by merit of course. Right. And, and indeed the dissenting justice categorized this as Orwellian, right? Basically this is as much as a, as a, it's a very harsh criticism, right? And, uh, and then all these, you know, news about the cutoffs, making this issue very visible. So now I'll bring three potential resolutions to this crisis. How should the violation of right of equality be avoided without creating a major loophole? I will remove the exclusion in all of them. 
But my method will depend on maybe the sequence of categories or uh, and uh, in the third point, I will not even suggest a sequential loop. I'll suggest them processing them simultaneously. Not first, not last EWS, all of them simultaneously. Okay, and you'll see the merit of that one. That will be the one that will appeal most to cancer uh, from uh, what I understand from our discussions. Now, in India, Supreme Court can revoke a constitutional amendment only if it breaches the basic structure of the constitution. Now, what does the majority justice say? They're saying it's a hardly a matter of debate that the challenge hearing is not any uh, executive order, even an ordinary legislation. They're saying we're not talking about, uh, uh, we are talking about a very special situation, they are saying, because amendment is a challenge. The challenge is found on, and in fact, could only be found on the premise that amendment in question violates the basic structure of the constitution. Yeah. Now, uh, the standing just argued that the exclusion breaches the basic structure by violating the right to equality. The majority justices make some technical arguments, but you know, I argue that you know, these arguments are not correct. Now, the following point of the majority justice makes sense though. Because of the separation of powers, the majority justices explain the hesitation to, to make too many changes as follows. The reason for minimal interference by this court in the constitutional amendment is not far to seek. And then they are talking about separation of powers. So that is entirely in line with minimalist market design, right? But minimalist in a particular way, minimalist in a consequential way, actually. At least that's my interpretation. Okay. So, so basically what I'll do is, I'll next formulate a policy that removes the violation of right to equality from the amendment through minimal interference, like and minimal in a consequential sense, minimal in a neoclassical sense. Okay, now, so this part is a bit technical. Let law not be the current profile of non-overlapping category memberships. Okay, so by current I mean with EWS. But with the current law. Okay, so that's wrong. Let E denote EWS category. Let J be a set of people whose right to equality is violated due to being excluded. Okay. <laughs> this could be either all members of scheduled caste OPC uh, scheduled tribes, or it could be a dear financial deplete members of these groups or maybe completely other group doesn't matter okay suppose the people potentially affected are these guys j guys now let me ask the following question okay which of these guys are materially affected because of that exclusion. Which one of them are hurt in the outcome? Okay. Well, one answer is the following. If an individual I remains unmatched under the current structure, even though she would be matched, if she were to be granted with the membership of category E instead of her existing category, then she can make that point, right? So this is like, indeed, this would also create an incentive compatibility issue if she had the ability to hide her, you know, cost certificate, which she doesn't. Even though you don't, you're not required to declare your cost status, for the other reservations, 
for the EWS, you are supposed to. So you cannot even get EWS by giving up scheduled cast status legally in India. Okay. If you could, there would be incentive compatibility issue. Too. So basically, given a profile of category memberships row, choice rule C, and a set of individuals I, the set of individuals J, who suffer from a violation of equality code under C for I, is if every member of capital J, for every member, they're unmatched under the uh, under law, but they would all be matched if instead their category was E instead of what it is. So basically, between these two, the only thing that differs is for these J guys. I'm changing their category. Okay. Now, instead, why am I not just giving them additional e membership? And instead, I'm getting rid of scheduled cast and giving e. Then over and above wouldn't be well defined. Right? To avoid that issue, I'm doing the following exercise. Who would rather get EWS membership instead of scheduled cast. In that way, I'm maintaining non overlapping structure, right? But then maybe Fujito and I am both in the same position. I'm compromised, he's compromised, except he has higher score. So if both of us were looked, only Fujito would be compromised, right? They are both wronged. I would be wrong if Fujito wasn't also wronged, but only one person is wrong, really. So, so this definition would deem me also suffering from this violation, even though I'm not really suffering, right? So as a result, as a result, I define the maximum set of individuals who suffer from violation of equality code taking that into consideration. So basically, uh, you guys see what I'm doing, right? Uh, just because, you know, I can deviate doesn't mean that uh, if others were also deviating, I would uh, also profit, right? So I'm finding the guys who would really benefit. And basically, the lemma says that this group, under the existing membership structure is uniquely defined. The set of individuals who are affected, materially affected, the maximum set of individuals is uniquely defined. Okay? So, so now, Let me consider, even though with the current system, there is no overlapping structure. With the mechanism I'm proposing, there is overlapping structure, right? So I did the earlier exercises with non-overlapping structure because I'm defining everything with respect to existing system. That's why I made this slightly funny exercise where I maintain that everybody is eligible only for one category. Otherwise, I would be introducing multiplicity and over and above would be non valuable if I couldn't do that. But now, for my purposes, with my correction, I allow for multiple memberships, right? So, that row star will be such that for every person is potentially compromised, I just give the extra membership, right? That's what the petitioners are asking, right? That's what they're asking. For everybody else, it stays the same. The first proposition is, first of all, 
if you choose EWS last over and above choice rule, nobody suffers from the violation of equality court under EWS last. Moreover, Indrasani's uh, conditions are satisfied. So this would be a legal thing to do. This is correct also with horizontal resolutions. Okay. So basically, first, this would be a legal resolution. But more important, there's nothing about minimalistic. Okay. So then the main result for EWS loss is the following. Consider any set of individuals, then the difference between the outcome of EWS last under this prior to, uh, under this membership structure and the outcome of the current system. What is the difference between EWS last and what is there? It's exactly the set of maximum set of individuals who suffer from a violation of equality court. So that in that sense, this is a minimal consequentialist minimalist change. Okay. A corollary is if there is no cutoff controversy, if there's no one compromised materially, then the outcome doesn't change. It's exactly the same as the existing system. Okay. So that is the case, and I suggest that this is in line with the majority view. Indeed, if Modi government knew this, I think they would want to do it, right? They would get pretty much the same outcome, except these headlines, right? Like you wouldn't have the, because you will only benefit if the cutoffs were shifting. If the cutoffs weren't shifting anyways, in other words, only if the affirmative action that completely perverse this makes uh, a change. Otherwise, this one also waters down the existing affirmative action system quite a bit. Okay. Now, I'm not suggesting that these systems necessarily will like this one. I just suggested that this is one possible. Now, remember that we talked about the conception of the concept of migration yesterday, right? Like they are trying to do everything in partitions. So if a scheduled cast member receives an open position, they think the person migrated from scheduled cast to open category or general category, because they use general and open. So why am I talking about that now? What makes the air policy a higher level AA policy is, it, prize, it provides members of reserve eligible categories with the benefit of mobility from their category to general category. Like one, the legal way, they see it in the AS. The guys moving from scheduled cast to open or general category whenever they don't need the benefit. And that's leaving the positions for the other group, right? So that is a specific benefit of VR protection. And we regulated that with the axiom of compliance with VR policy, right? But if you read, the descending opinion of Justice Ravindra Bhatt, there is something, I mean, you can see how sophisticated this justice is. There's something quite amazing about his descending opinion. And there are many things amazing about his uh, descending opinion. He understands that, he understands all these dynamics. In the exclusion clause operates in an utterly arbitrary manner. First, it, others subjected to socially questionable and outlawed practices, though they are amongst the poorest section of society. Secondly, for the purpose of this new reservation, the exclusion operates against the social disadvantaged caste, absolutely by confining them within their allocated reservation quotas. Thirdly, 
It denies the chance of mobility from reserve quota to a reservation benefit based on economic deprivation. So Ravindra Bhatt not only wants removing exclusion, it, he also wants to maintain the higher status of preparatory reservations. And in particular, if an individual qualifies for both of them, schedule cost and EWS, he wants the person to be moved from EWS to, uh, no, from schedule cost to EWS. You shouldn't use the schedule cost. But just like what we are doing in the open, you should do, also do the same thing for EWS. Okay. Well, I can formalize that very much like you know, our third axiom, but now between non EWS reserve categories and E instead of O. It's exactly the same thing, but now it's moving from scheduled cost to EWS. Basically, people in the EWS, they have to have higher score that people, uh, people who receive the schedule class position. That's what he wants, right? Now, together with the existing mandates in Indrasani, this, in, this additional axiom uniquely implies EWS first. So very, in other words, Ravindra wants, uh, Ravindra Bhatt wants an additional normative requirement, which corresponds to maintaining the privileged situation of this special reservation. Preparatory reservations, preparatory and compensatory. And it also makes sense, right? I mean, uh, because of the logic of uh, these reservations. Okay. So that's the justification for EWS first. Now, I will go very fast here, sorry. The part Penzo likes, uh, instead of doing EWS first or EWS Rust, I can treat all VR protection symmetrically, right? And I can allocate them together in a way that maximizes the number of VR protections that are honored. Very much like uh, the meritorious uh, horizontal, but now for vertical ones. Okay. And if I do that, I will call this choice rule meritorious over and about choice rule. So this one is no longer a member of sequential uh, choice rules. It's a smart reserve. Okay? Now, uh, this rule satisfies all the rule laws. Moreover, its outcome deal dominates any other legal rule. What does deal dom dominates mean? Subject to the laws, like if you look at the outcome of meritorious over and above choice rule, and any other legal choice rule, the merit score of the top guy and meritorious over and above is at least as high as the merit score of the other one, same thing for the second guy, same thing for the third guy, everybody. So there's a, this also has a very plausible normative implication action. So that's why I call it technocratic solution. I think that one is the one which economists will like most actually, right? We are treating all categories, all we are putting categories symmetrically, right? Okay. So now let me conclude. I will have two types of conclusions. I have a conclusion for this paper and I'll have a conclusion for the lecture series or I will have several conclusions for the lecture series. For this paper, the key arguments by the majority justices 
in their defense of the exclusion of uh, SCBCs from EWS reservation in the controversial Supreme Court ruling are basic outright false. And the way they are making a mistake is kind of similar to a false proof in a theory, really. I mean, not only they are false, they are like technical in nature. Like justices probably shouldn't need to make that kind of uh, statement without you know, getting some help uh, from people familiar with formalism, right? Basically, they were thinking in the world of non-overlapping reservations in a judgment which was questioning the validity of that assumption. It's kind of like a very basic uh, mistake, actually, analytically. Since these arguments are technical in nature, experience, uh, experiences like this suggest an important support role for design economists, right? But we'll be taken seriously only if we stick to you know, what they're trying to do and not change the nature of the problem. And basically, in this court case, there could have been at least three plausible solutions which wouldn't have that controversy. I'm not saying that majority and dissenting justices would necessarily agree between uh, which one to pick, right? Uh, depending yeah. on whether you want to maintain the higher status of you know, repertory reservation versus not. Uh, so maybe they wouldn't completely agree, but the controversy wasn't there and it would be easier to, the fight wouldn't be as big. Right? And maybe they could reach meritorious as a compromise, actually. Meritorious one wouldn't pick, wouldn't favor EWS over scheduled cost, is neutral. But because scheduled cost people already have their scheduled cost reservation, the outcome of this policy in many cases will be either very similar to EWS last, or it might be exactly the same actually. So this will be an E in itself because it's a technical solution with a good logic, but to someone who is very consequentialist, the outcome wouldn't be too different than what they want anyways. So that would make it a good candidate for a resolution actually. Okay. So this also highlights the importance of in, informed neutrality. If I just like initially we were writing this paper with just EWS last, and my mind was let's do the minimum change. Right? I wasn't thinking about informed neutrality. I didn't see obviously the judgment didn't happen. Uh, you know, like I don't see by that point the uh, point about mobility didn't exist. Uh, by Justice Watt, right? So, so basically, this shows the importance of, you know, dealing with this multiplicity in a careful way. Okay, and uh, so, and we know that this multiplicity is important, like in Boston, in H one B, uh, in Boston school choice, uh, not understanding these aspects caused in you know, policy reversals, unintended policy reversals. Uh, these loopholes were kind of uh, utilized by uh, former President Trump's, uh, you know, initiative of changing the H-1B rules under the by American, by American executive. Okay. What about conclusions for lecture series? So I have multiple ones. Uh, commission market design is fundamentally different than aspired market design by an uh, outsider. Like political economy is completely different. In commission market design, the need for change is already established. Uh, commission design economies is chosen mostly based on past success and experience. She's given lots of flexibility on various details. Custom made theory is not expected. A strong case can be made through experimental, empirical, or computational techniques. Right? It's a different world. Whereas aspired market design, the need for a change is not established. There will be a lot of resistance for reform. Motives will be questioned. 
a complete persuasion strategy is absolutely necessary for a reform, past success or merely providing intuition for, from previous research uh, will not be compelling factors to convince policymakers who have vested interest in maintaining the status quo. And custom-made theory, which represents the true goals of the stakeholders, may be an important part of the persuasion strategy. That's what I've been showing, right? So minimalist market design as an integrated paradigm for research and policy uh, is actually has a very strong persuasion element in it. So like the part that is most critical is the persuasion stage. The starting point is not a compelling design. Like this didn't work in Turkish college admissions uh, or in the first attempt with the army. It's never enough. It's rather a truly bad mechanism with respect to true mission of the institution. Against all odds, uh, we may be able to convince authorities that the uninvited design economist critical of their institution can actually be a valuable partner with this methodology. And by now, there is fairly strong evidence that that strategy is working. I mean, if you look at policy impact, you know, there's policy impact in school choice, there's policy impact in kidney exchange, liver exchange, US Army's branching system, pandemic ration of scarce medical resources for vaccines, therapies, monoclonal antibodies, and now actually for broader clinical care guidance, uh, Oregon is adopt, suggesting adopting resources for, for all crises. Uh, not necessarily just pandemic, also other disaster situations. Okay. But then there is also external validity, right? Which is not something we typically see in uh, the, you know, other forms of other methodologies of uh, market design. Okay, and my last point is the following. Uh, oh. We talk mostly about policy impact, but these tools can also be used to avoid unintended policy mistakes. And in Boston, that happened actually. And our analysis led to complete dropping of works on priorities in Boston. You can check that out. This is the JP paper uh, with Dr. Scott Cominos and Parak Patak. But the point that I really want to make here is the following, this last point. Now, I think this methodology is also very helpful to advanced theory. In his 2017 Nature Human Behavior Perspective, Duncan Watts, he's a very uh, prominent scholar, very uh, from a social scientist, he suggests that science, social science, should be done in a different way. He says that social science has generated a tremendous number of theories on the topics of individual and collective human behavior, but it has been much less successful at reconciling the innumerable inconsistencies and contradictions among these competing explanations. You're saying too many theories, they all contradict, they, many of them contradict with each other, uh, and no problem is solved. According to Duncan Watts, this incoherency problem has been perpetuated by an historical emphasis in social science on the advancement of theories over the solution of political problem, uh, practical problems. You think this is happening because people give emphasis on developing theories, but not solving actual problems. And as one possible solution to the Incoherence of problem is to reject the traditional distinction between basing and applied science and instead seek to advance theories specifically in the service of solving real world problems. Okay. Well, I completely agree with him, right? And indeed, my entire career is a bit like a proof of concept of his thesis, right? So I really didn't intend to develop theories. I want to solve real problems. But to do so, I had to advance theory. 
And I think by now, you know, there is, so at least I've been able to do that in the context of house allocation. You know, we introduced normative approach to priority-based allocation of indivisible goods. There's a huge detection on school choice, living to an organ exchange, matching with specific priorities, reserve systems. So minimalist market design doesn't just is an effective persuasion too. It's also an effective way to advance theory. So basically, so this exercise, or at least uh, my experience suggests a specific answer to the following question posed in the title of Duncan Watts' paper. Should social science be more solution oriented? And my answer would be yes. Well, thank you very much for your patience, which I tested a lot. I'm hoping uh, uh, there was some light. Thank, thank you.